In our functional medicine clinic, I always do a detailed intake of a patient's diet and daily habits. And very often the patient would say, often apologetically, oh, I drink coffee. And I always smile, recognizing a kindred soul, and always make a point to discuss that in more depth with the patient. Because it tells me something important. Somewhere along the way, coffee picked up a reputation. People started feeling like they had to apologize for it. So let me ask you, why is coffee bad? Is it actually bad? Or is it just a propaganda from companies selling mud or mushroom drinks? And as a coffee lover and a coffee snob, I will not call these drinks coffee. So today we will talk about why coffee can be great for some people and not so great for others. How many cups of coffee are safe to drink? What recent studies are showing about the powerful link between coffee and liver health? And what we are now learning about coffee, mental health, and even biological aging? Welcome back, I'm Dr. Maria Zizian, a board-certified general surgeon and an IFM-certified functional medicine physician. On this channel, I share health tips on skin health, food and supplements, functional medicine, surgery, and the latest medical research to help you feel your best. And if that sounds good, please like, share with your friends and family, and subscribe. Before I go into some coffee history, I have to say that none of what I say about coffee pertains to energy drinks. I hate energy drinks, never had one in my life, as they are extremely detrimental to your whole body. They put a band-aid on your low energy symptoms and they don't cure you of anything and they may cause significant cardiac issues. But enough about that, let's talk about coffee. So the story of coffee goes back to Ethiopia where a goat herder noticed that his goats became unusually energetic after eating bright red berries from a wild tree. Curious, he tried the berries himself. The rest, as they say, is history. From there, coffee made its way across the Red Sea to the port city of Mocha in present-day Yemen, which became one of the world's first major coffee trading hubs, so influential that the word mocha is still used today. Interestingly, coffee didn't just become a drink. It became a place to gather, a place to talk, a place to think, a place to work. Even today, for many of us, coffee isn't just about caffeine. It's about routine, comfort, and connection. But the biggest question is why does coffee feel so powerful? So let's look closer. Caffeine blocks a chemical in the brain called adenosine. Adenosine is a chemical that tells your brain that you are tired, so caffeine blocks it. At the same time, caffeine gently boosts dopamine, adrenaline, and norepinephrine. And that's why after coffee, you often feel more awake, more focused, more motivated, and sometimes even in a better mood. Coffee also helps you burn fat for energy, which is why some people feel more physically energized after drinking it. But here's another question. Why does coffee affect us so differently? And I'm sure you have noticed that one person can drink coffee and feel calm and focused. Another drinks the same cup and feels shaky, anxious, or can't sleep that night. That difference isn't willpower or personality. The reason is genetics. Researchers started by looking at a gene called CYP1A2. This is the main gene that controls how quickly your liver breaks down caffeine. Based on this gene, people fall into two main groups. Some people are fast metabolizers. They break down caffeine quickly, so the stimulating effects rise and fall fairly fast. Others are slow metabolizers. In them, caffeine stays in the bloodstream much longer, continuing to stimulate the nervous system, tighten blood blood vessels, raise blood pressure, and increase heart rate for many hours after the coffee is finished. Once researchers separated people this way, they asked a simple question. Does coffee affect the heart the same way in both groups? And you guessed it. The answer was no. They found that in people who are slow caffeine metabolizers, the risk of heart attack begins to rise when coffee intake reaches three or more cups per day, and the risk becomes even higher at four cups a day and beyond. In contrast, in fast metabolizers, that same number of cups did not show the same increase in heart attack risk. So the number isn't random. 
For certain people, once you cross that three cup per day line, your heart may be under more strain than you realize. Not because coffee is dangerous, but because your body clears it more slowly. And here's something many people don't think about. Heart attacks are not always dramatic. In people with diabetes, nerve damage, or long-standing stress, some heart attacks can be silent. No crushing chest pain, no sudden warning, and the damage can quietly build over time and only be discovered years later. So when we talk about three or more cups of coffee a day being risky for some people, we're really talking about a mismatch between the dose and that person's biology. And just a quick note here, these studies measured coffee in cups, not in exact caffeine milligrams, because real world coffee strength varies widely based on the bean, on the brew, and the serving size. I wish they provided the exact milligrams. And we will come back to it at the end of this video where I will discuss caffeine amounts in popular American brands such as Starbucks, Dunkin, etc. So taking this science information into account, you may understand that is why for some people the beneficial effects of coffee such as ability to focus better, be more alert and energized are more pronounced, while in others coffee may lead to anxiety, palpitations and increase in blood pressure. The slow metabolizers are most likely to be in a second group with bad side effects. I do have to add that there are also people who have a sensitivity to caffeine. In that case, you can be a fast metabolizer, but for some reason you have developed a sensitivity to it. Sensitivity is an immune response. And when you drink coffee, having sensitivity, your immune system will react just like it reacts to any food sensitivity. If you're interested in food sensitivities, you can check out my book, The Clear Skin Diet, Unlocking the Secret Link Between Food Sensitivities and Skin Health, where I delve into 17 food groups that could be implicated in food sensitivities, causing all kinds of side effects such as joint pain, migraines, chronic fatigue, brain fog, and more. And I have the whole chapter on caffeine, and the link is in the description of this video. So now let's switch to a recent study about caffeine and liver, and it may really surprise you. But before I do that, I want to share a few words about my passion for coffee. As an Armenian, it is in my blood. We drink espresso-style cups of very fine ground coffee made in this beautiful special container called Jasve, and we drink it all day long, in the early morning to wake up early afternoon to restore energy in the evening while socializing. And it is ingrained in Armenian culture. And you get a cup of coffee when you go to somebody's house almost before you sit down. One of the reasons we can get away with it is because each cup doesn't have a lot of caffeine. It is relatively light. But we will come back to the caffeine amount at the end when I share my recommendations. Now, let's see what the science tells us. A recent large scientific review, the link is in the description, looked at the decades of data on coffee and liver disease. And the results were remarkable consistent. Regular coffee drinkers tended to have lower rates of fatty liver, alcoholic liver disease, chronic viral hepatitis, progression of sterosis, and even liver cancer. Why would coffee protect the liver? Because coffee contains far more than just caffeine. It contains compounds like chlorogenic acids, cafestol, caffeol, and many polyphenols. And these substances help reduce oxidative stress, calm inflammation, slow down scarring in the liver, improve fat handling inside liver cells, and even support healthier gut bacteria. So for many patients, moderate coffee intake actually supports the liver rather than harming it. And now, one of the other most fascinating findings. A recent study, also linked for you in the description, looked at people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder with psychosis. These are conditions that are known to speed up biological aging in the body and uh, thus shorten life expectancy. The researchers examined chromosomal telomeres. Telomeres are the protective caps on the ends of our chromosomes. And you can think of them like the plastic tips at the end of shoelaces. When telomeres get shorter, cells age faster. When telomeres are longer, that usually means slower biological aging, which is a good thing. What they found was striking. The people who drank about three to four cups of coffee per day had longer telomeres than the ones who didn't drink coffee at all, equivalent of being about five years younger at the cellular levels. But once again, there was a ceiling. The benefit peaked at three to four cups. Once intake went beyond that, the protection faded. 
and once again. So the same pattern shows up. Moderation matters. So let's put together what we now know about coffee. For the brain, coffee improves alertness and focus. For the liver, moderate coffee intake is often protective of liver disease. For cellular aging, moderate coffee may help slow the clock. For the heart, the effect depends strongly on your genetics. So, I would like to say that coffee is not something you need to apologize for. It is one of the most biologically active drinks we consume. For many people, it supports liver health, metabolic function, mental clarity, and even cellular longevity. But like many powerful things in medicine, the dose matters and the person matters. So, I ask my patients, how does coffee make you feel? Do you feel calm and focused or anxious and wired? Do you sleep well or are you staring at the ceiling at night? Is your blood pressure stable or does it creep up after you drink coffee? Your body is always giving you clues. So how much coffee do you need to drink or how much coffee can you drink a day? At our functional medicine clinic, Many of our patients undergo medical genetics testing, so they know if they're slow or fast metabolizers. However, most general public doesn't know their genetic status. So I recommend, in general, one to two cups of coffee per day, provided that it makes you feel good, doesn't raise your blood pressure, doesn't cause palpitations, or keeps you up at night. If one cup causes any of these symptoms, then just don't drink it at all. Additionally, keep in mind that I'm talking about a small cup of coffee containing 100 milligram of caffeine and that can vary a lot between the brands and here's the table with caffeine content of different brands as you may see there's a lot of variability as always if in doubt discuss with your doctor if for some reason you should abstain from caffeine otherwise check labels and enjoy thank you so much for watching i'm looking forward to reading your comments until next time bye bye